welcome. Dr. Majumdar is a professor of economics at the University of Bordwan in West uh, Bengal, India. He teaches development economics and his research interests are in labor economics, regional development, climate change, energy infra infrastructure, and human development. So as part of this interview, we had asked you to send us um, an image to serve as a marker for the discussion, uh, and which can be related to the course's theme for this year, which is crisis and resilience. Yeah, so this is the picture. Um, so Professor, what can you tell us about this photograph? Uh, okay, Shahid, uh, this photograph is actually uh, of, uh, from Press Trust of India, the PTI who are basically a news agency. Uh, this picture relates uh, to the tropical cyclone that hit the eastern coast of India uh, around May, end of May. And uh, this uh, is also related to some of the migrant workers who were returning home uh, after the lockdown was announced uh, to uh, tackle the pandemic, the COVID pandemic. And uh, they were returning home, and uh, by that time, the cyclone had struck. So uh, many of their homes were actually destroyed, and they had to uh, actually been guided to the cyclone shelters by the National Disaster Response Force, uh, those people in these orange dresses there. A massive cyclone making landfall in eastern India near Bangladesh. It's one of the most powerful storms ever recorded in the Bay of Bengal. Millions of people have been forced to leave their homes with widespread damage expected. The flood-prone region is densely populated with many vulnerable communities. Over two and a half million people have been evacuated from low-lying areas and are being housed in shelters. The coronavirus pandemic has further complicated matters. Many locals, officials say, have also been uh, dead set against going to these facilities over concerns that they might contract COVID-19 given that this was being used as a coronavirus facility. So a lot of challenges also given that there will possibly be some casualties and injuries that will also put a lot of strain on existing stretched hospital resources as well. So uh, this is a picture that uh, looks at two hazards, two crises uh, striking at the same time, and uh, the response of the stakeholders and the society. So you mentioned that there were some successful interventions that happened before the cyclone that led to building resilience. So I was just wondering if you could shed some light on what these successful interventions were, and then what were the failures? Uh, Yes, you see, uh, eastern coast of India is susceptible to cyclones for quite long. I mean, it has a long history of, uh, of uh, devastating cyclones. In fact, I have uh, just uh, finished a paper on this, uh, this pandemic and cyclone and this resilience, which is going to be published in an edited volume uh, coming up from uh, Mumbai University, where I think Shahidi had visited. Mm -hmm. So uh, there uh, I have drawn these historical anecdotes, how devastating cyclones have been in eastern India. So uh, starting from 1970s onwards, the government of India tried to uh, tackle cyclone in a much more coordinated and much more uh, sort of, what I would say, in a, in a uh, integrated approach. So uh, there were three basic uh, pillars on which this cyclone management and resilience planning was built up. The first was uh, to have uh, scientific and technological capabilities in terms of state-of-the-art early warning system and tracking of cyclone. So that has been excellent over the last 30 years or so. So we have very early warning and dissemination of that warning through leaflets, through public address system, through mobile cell phone messages and all those things. The second was building of uh, cyclone shelters uh, with some support from the World Bank. Uh, so throughout the coastline, lots of cyclone shelters were built up where people could be moved and evacuated and moved during cyclone. The third thing was that there was a there was a quite a good coordination, especially after the building of of the National Disaster Management Authority and the National Disaster Response Force uh, that was uh, in 2006. So because of that, uh, the loss of life could be cut down drastically from cyclones. But obviously, uh, loss of property and loss of uh, economic activities could not be uh, cut down that much. 
uh, but uh, loss of life could be cut down very drastically. And that was, uh, these three were the basic in ingredients of the success in bringing down loss from cyclone over the last uh, 15, 20 years. But this time it was a little bit different. So uh, what happened is that one of the major problem with cyclone management had been that the coastal regulatory zone, uh, these regulations were not adhered to because of uh, economic reasons, like because the whole coastal belt is uh, one of the most poor regions of the country. So uh, the people, they base their livelihood on the coastal activities. And so a lot of economic activities are basically built on the coastline. So this means that uh, they're exposed. The exposure level is higher. And if exposure level is higher, vulnerability is also higher. So uh, this made uh, this resilience uh, less effective because of this higher exposure of economic activities and people towards this uh, cyclone. And uh, if you want to uh, focus on this year, uh, it was compounded by the presence of the pandemic. Because uh, from March, because of the pandemic, there was a complete lockdown. And that lockdown means there was no movement of uh, goods, there was no movement of people. And in fact, Indian Railways, uh, the largest rail network in terms of people carried, uh, came to a standstill for the first time after the independence of India. And because of that, the movement of people, the stocking of commodities, the evacuation of people to the shelters all suffered. People were reluctant to move to shelters because they feared that in these closed quarters, coming in close proximity of one another, they could contract the COVID. So uh, there are a lot of difficulties in managing the human activities, right? Uh, managing the people. And this could have been could have been sort of overcome to some extent through communication. But what the cyclone did is that it uh, it destroyed all the communication towers. Like I mean, electricity was not there. Cell phone towers uh, were toppled down. So the communication network broke down. And as a result, the rescue operations and and the rehabilitation operations actually they suffered. There's so much room and potential for a lot of these compounded hazards, right? Like one country would have maybe two hurricanes that were happening around the same time. It happened in Louisiana this uh, past summer. They were hit by one uh, hurricane and then were hit by another one, right as they were trying to recover from the next one. So moving forward, how do you envision the discourse around resilience will change, especially as the world faces more compound hazards? Like how will resilience planning change? That we, How do you take into account all of these different hazards? <laughs> No, I think uh, you see before this before this uh, compound events actually happen and uh, the different types of compound hazards one uh, biological hazard and the other uh, natural environmental hazard uh, over uh, which uh, over none of which uh, we really had any control right so uh, I think uh, the planners the policy makers and uh, I would say the government across the world have now been sort of shaken up that they have woken up to the reality that yes, these events uh, can happen and they can happen together. And so uh, once they happen, they have a huge economic cost. They have, to, they have to integrate the resilience planning for different types of, different types of events, different types of hazards together. Like now they cannot, they cannot just plan for a, a cyclone without keeping in mind that it may well happen that there is something like a pandemic and they have to maintain a physical distance. So uh, now, we are, now we are hearing of that we have to build up a uh, lot more uh, cyclone shelters so that even we can accommodate people even after uh, maintaining the physical distance uh, that is necessary. Uh, similarly, uh, different, uh, different protocols that we have, standard operating protocols under different disasters, they have they were basically in silos, right? They were they were built for one type of hazard uh, uh, for separated uh, like in different compartments. But now they have to think of that. Okay, two or three events can occur together, and then how do we integrate between them? How the standard operating protocols uh, should actually look like under this compound situation? So so the so the discussion have started at least in the academic uh, and the so-called the interaction between the government and the academicians. And I think 
that uh, we would move in in that direction the movement would be a little bit a little bit speedier um i was wondering if you could just give us a little bit of an overview of what the migrant situation is like in india um that you discussed in the research that you provided us and to explain kind of what is this reverse migration that we're seeing and what factors play the biggest role in, in, in resulting in this migration? Well, you see, uh, India uh, being a heterogeneous country and a large country, mm. and uh, because of uh, inter-regional differences in the economic level, there are certain pockets where economic activities are concentrated. And there are certain pockets where uh, economic activities are sparse. So uh, people are always on the move, like the classic uh, migration models of people moving from the less developed areas to the more developed and economically happening areas. So uh, at present, more or less 40% of India's workers are migrant workers. And they're migrant workers at different levels because in migrated workers in India are of different forms. One. There is a long-term migrant who have shifted out and were staying elsewhere for five years, ten years or more. Then there are what we call the semi-permanent migrants who actually have moved out, but they have moved out for three to five years. They're working in a different city, but they always have the connection with their homeland, with their with their native place, and they keep on going back and forth. And we also have what we call the circular migrants or the seasonal migrants. These type of migrants are like those strawberry pickers. They move uh, along the agricultural seasons, like they go for the harvesting season or they go for the for the sowing season, and they also go for a lot of construction work in the in the uh, lean agricultural season when there is no work to be done in their villages, in their own villages. So uh, there is this type of two different types of trains that happen. That sometimes people go out during the agricultural busy season because there is a demand for work in some other place. And people also move out in the lean agricultural season because there is nothing to be done in their, in their own place, in their own villages. So this, this uh, migration situation in India is very complex and one has to really go into uh, in depth into the, into the working of the migrants and the movement of the migrants and the characteristic of the migrants to understand, to have a grasp over that. Exodus that hasn't been seen in India in decades. Thousands of migrant workers are on the move, most of them on foot. There are 120 million migrant workers in India, many of whom are daily wage earners. After businesses shut, many like Kiran can no longer afford to pay rent. She's traveling 300 kilometers with her young child. Uh, you see, when the, when the migrants actually found that in the place where they were staying, they are not welcome. Because obviously the migrants uh, had to stay in their destination place in cramped atmosphere. Like, they, they stayed uh, five persons in a room and all those things. And they, their work were mostly in terms of uh, casual employment. They were not like a permanent type of jobs. So once when the lockdown was announced for one week, two weeks, three weeks, they thought that the lockdown would be withdrawn because initially you would remember that they were announced for 21 days. So they were hoping that, okay, after 21 days, everything would be normal. So they stayed put and they spent all their money for, for running over this 21 days, during which time they did not get any wages because since the, since the workplace were closed. And after that, when the lockdown was extended, what they found is that they don't have any money and they don't have any sort of entitlements to visit the medical facilities which are available in their destination place where they were staying. And so they wanted to get back to their own native place where they could at least get some food to eat, at least some place to stay, and at least their their uh, near and dear ones to just look at them and to feel secure. The whole sort of sort sort of mental security that you get when you are surrounded by your family people. But then they found that not only are the public transport system closed down, 
it has been declared illegal to move from one place to another. So, I mean, there are horror stories of people getting cramped inside uh, milk uh, tankers or oil tankers or lorries. I mean, what we used to hear in India about people moving from, say, from uh, Western Asia to Eastern Europe, the whole lot of refugee problems that we have been hearing of and the so-called horror stories of people moving across countries to just move from Syria and other places to Germany and Italy and Greece, that happened in India. And we lost lives of migrants trying to get back from their workplace to their home. So this was the type of situation that we faced during April, May, and June. So, so what were the policy failures? Like what led to this? Um, like be beyond what you talked about, which is like the lockdowns, there isn't any health benefits. Like what could have been done better? Lockdown was uh, very sudden, right? And it was uh, so sudden that people did not have time to, to be prepared for that. Second, I think the policymakers did not have a clear idea about the magnitude of migrant workers and the complexity of migrant workers in today's India. This was second thing. They did not imagine that there are so many migrants and so many different types of migrants who would be facing a problem. And third policy failure was that uh, what we have been speaking for quite some time now is that the migrants in India do not have entitlements in their destination place save a few states like Kerala and some other places, but those are isolated cases. The migrants do not have any health card. They do not have any migrant identity card, which provides them certain sort of records, certain sort of food entitlement, certain sort of medical entitlement, certain sort of education entitlement for their children. And the ways they are put up, their housing conditions, their living conditions are pathetic. So the, I think the government did not have a clear idea about about the complexity and the real uh, situation that the migrant workers face. And then they could have actually, even after the lockdown, they could have run certain special trains, special transport facilities to bring the migrants back and to keep them in shelters, keep them in quarantines, but at least give them certain, what I would say, certain humane, uh, humane environment or human attitude towards them. Do you think the um, what happened with the migrant workers and the arguably lack of um, um, reaction from the government, do you, do you think that's going to change and there's going to be better policies to protect these migrant workers? Um, yeah, it will, it will work both ways. Please. It will work both ways in a sense that the government has learned from its mistakes mm -hmm. and now it is much more prepared. It now knows where the where the fault lines actually lie, and so uh, they have addressed quite quite a few of these issues. And so, if they happen once more, they are much more prepared. Yeah. At the same time, the people are also much more prepared in a sense that they know uh, uh, people on the streets. They they speak of that. Okay, uh, in India, the second uh, the flu season is a little bit late, right? It, it starts around December. December, January, February is the flu season in India. So uh, then they apprehend that if things go out of control, then another lockdown may, may be announced. So they are much more prepared about that. They know that if the lockdown is announced, we would have to get back or we have to stock up with things. And certain uh, basic, uh, basic uh, activities would go on, but most of the activities may again be clamped down. So there is, there is readiness and there is preparedness from both sides, both from the government and from the people. The second thing about trust on the government is that, uh, you see, in India, since we have a sort, sort of a federal type of government, the, the policies and the actions vary across states. Mm -hmm. So there are certain states who have, been, who have done very well. There are states who have done well, uh, not because of the policies, but in spite of the policies. And there are certain states who have, which has not done well. But what has happened is that uh, People now uh, know that uh, on one hand, their livelihood and their economic activities has to go on. So they try to innovate. Like now we have a lot more what we call the home delivery system at work. Earlier, the home delivery system was 
like much more on an organized level on the on the part of the conglomerates and the organized sector like Swiggy and Amazon and Flipkart and all those things. But now we have home delivery even for the local fishmonger or local grocer who says that you just give me a call and I will send things to you. So people have innovated from that way also that they have tried to try to look, try to ensure their livelihood and economic activities even if the government imposes a lockdown. So uh, people are also innovating. Their, their business ideas are also coming up. So in a sense, I think even if the second lockdown is announced or the, or the second wave comes, uh, society is much more prepared. So uh, the unrest or the confusion would be less. I, I have no idea about what the health impact would be because that would depend on the intensity of the, of the biological hazard. But as a development economist, the, the confusion would be less certainty would be more and people are now prepared to innovate and carry on with their day-to-day -day activity. I think this is actually a great point to end because it just highlights how important resilience is, right? Because now we're much more able to absorb the shock and react and adapt to it as opposed uh, to before. And it happened with experience, unfortunately, but moving forward, I guess we just have to figure out ways to be ahead of the yeah, curve. Yeah, of course. Uh, of course. Um, uh, I just want to say thank so, you, you so much I, for your time. If, 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 if I can intervene for one minute here, just yeah, like of you course. said of learning. Yeah, when my little daughter used to run uh, along in my hallway, there was this little age of my working table, right? So the first three or four times she stumbled on that corner. But after doing it two to three times or three to four times, she always used to run in full speed, but always uh, was able to avoid that corner. So that is what uh, these hazards teach us to make us resilient, that we don't fall down. It's a great example. Uh, but again, Professor Majumda, thank you so much. We really appreciate this, taking the time off your schedule to come talk to us. I do, I do want to thank you a lot for, for giving us your time. Welcome. Thank you so much.